in Tokyo and I want to die. <laughs> oh my God. You might notice a bit of a sweat on my brow. That's sort of a mixture of stress and also it's just so hot. I finally got rid of my suitcases, which I just hate with a passion. I almost had a moment where I wanted to kick them but then I remembered there's quite a lot of valuable stuff inside of them. Right now, I'm trying to go to Senso G, which I have been to twice already, but there's a good reason. It's November 3rd today, which is Culture Day in Japan. And I think there's gonna be some sort of like procession or like parade happening there. Wish me luck, everyone. I'm gonna give it my best shot. It turns out I was on my way to something known as Shirasagi no Mai, or the Dance of the White Herons. It was incredibly busy, as expected, but all of a sudden, after a bit of waiting around, the crowds parted, and a bunch of women dressed in what I can only describe as the coolest outfits I have ever seen appeared. I mean, look at those hats. I'm not even being sarcastic here. I love the fit. <laughs> They were preceded by a bunch of guys in samurai armor and a man with a very fancy umbrella and then following them was a huge float topped with a band of sorts playing traditional Japanese music. Eventually, after walking very slowly and stopping many, many times to do a little circle, they reached their performance area and a beautiful dance commenced. During their dance, they were sprinkled with underwhelming amounts of confetti, but the whole thing was really nice and the big fan-like wings that they had strapped to their backs was probably the most exciting part for me. Made it feel like much more of a display. There was one little mishap um, to no fault of their own. Midway through the performance, this random American woman just walked through the dance floor straight up to the man drumming at the back and she said something like so I'm from the Mississippi Buddhist Society and our temple leader passed away this fall so if I could just get you to bless his ashes real quick and it's like this poor guy doesn't speak much English is in the middle of drumming for one of the most important festivals at Tokyo's most famous shrine and I'm pretty sure the festival in question is Shinto by the way it's not even Buddhist so that annoyed me but just leave the poor guy alone to do his little rat-a-tat-tat -tat. don't bother him while he's mid performance anyway I tried not to let it ruin the whole occasion for me and I just felt lucky to have caught a festival at all during my trip because I think it's one of the best and most fun ways to experience a culture isn't it and revisiting Sensoji Shrine, the first place I ever got lost in Tokyo, was a nice way to mark the halfway point of my six week trip. And here I am back where it started three weeks ago. I've reached a halfway point in my trip and do you want to hear a little bit of character progression? The same lady, the very same lady who asked me to sign a petition to save Japan's oceans asked me again and do you know what I said this time? I said oh no I'm really sorry I've already signed it. I refused, downright refused to, didn't even sign up a second time. As you can see, I was buzzing because I had completed my first little Japanese circuit. If you haven't watched my previous videos, three weeks before this, I travelled north out of Tokyo to Gunma Prefecture, then heading onwards to Niigata and Sado Island before dipping up to Yamagata and then making my way back south via Tochigi Prefecture. So I was here in the big city, reunited with the golden poo of Asakusa, and also reunited with my best friend Miles, just recharging in preparation for the next three weeks of my journey, where I would do another circuit, but this time to the south. I say I was recharging, but what I actually ended up doing was maybe the most adrenaline pumping thing possible, as I had managed to snag tickets for me and Miles to go to the J-League Levian Cup final at Tokyo National Stadium. Football! Football! That's right, it's the big game day everyone. A Vispa Fukuoka versus the Urawa Red Diamonds. I myself have always been and will always be a big red diamond. Our name is a suit. Our name is a suit. Urawa Red Diamonds. <laughs> Our name is a suit. But yeah, I imagine it's going to be a bit of a hectic time, so wish us luck. And it certainly was hectic, but not in the way we expected, as the main challenge proved to be actually getting inside of the stadium. Here, let me just draw this out for you real quick. Now, I had bought a QR code voucher for two tickets in the upper south stand. So as we got to Tokyo Stadium, we went to the south stand and asked a steward where we were supposed to be, and they sent us to Gate E. But when we arrived at Gate E, another steward sent us to Gate D, and then when they scanned my QR code at Gate D, it didn't work. 
So another very nice steward went and found another very nice steward who told us to follow him to a ticket stand back at gate E. And at this ticket stand, the woman behind the desk told us we needed to go to gate A, which of course was on the exact opposite side of the stadium. With the game starting in just a few minutes, we speed walked all the way around the stadium and upon reaching the correct ticket desk, I exchanged my QR code for two tickets for seats back at gate E. So we had to go all the way back around the stadium again and finally, after viewing the outside of the stadium from every conceivable angle, we were in. The atmosphere as we walked out of the tunnel was insane, way way better than I had imagined anyway. The Red Diamonds fans were jumping up and down, singing their hearts out from minute one to the bitter end. And they had some bangers honestly, the chants they were singing really brought a tear to the eye, but also just made you want to bust a move, you know? Unfortunately, the game didn't go so well for us Urawa fans. Five minutes in and Avispa Fukuoka had already taken a 1-0 lead. The Avispans erupted into celebration as we and the other Red Diamonds fans despaired. Because to be quite frank, we were playing terribly. Honestly, I'm not sure I've seen a worse team in my life. We had this one striker called Jose Kante, who every single time he got the ball, everything broke down. Like, I swear he was wearing trampoline shoes. The fans came kept jumping and singing and waving their flags, but things went from bad to worse, as just before half time, which is arguably the worst time to concede, we did just that, and the score was now 2-0 in a Vispa Fukuoka's favour. So then, a big second half needed, but the Red Diamonds didn't quite get the memo, and less than 10 minutes after the restart, they gave away a penalty. However, with a tremendous save from our keeper Nishikawa, whose name I know because the fans chanted it for the next 30 minutes, the Red Diamonds burst into life, and the comeback was on. In the 66th minute, a long ball was sent over the top, and the deficit was reduced to half. I hope you believe in miracles everyone, because in the dying seconds of the game, 95th minute, Jose Kante picked up the ball on the edge of the box and hit the post. Of course he did. And just like that, it was all over. Fair play, Avispa Fukuoka. You win this one. All in all though, it was a really fun experience and an exciting match actually, so I can't really complain. And so with all the excitement out of the way, the rest of my second stay in Tokyo was a bit more relaxed and was spent zipping around the place seeing a bunch of famous sites such as Tokyo Tower, this hologram of a cat, um, a statue of Godzilla, by which there was a really disturbing live performance happening. I have no idea what's going on there, but whatever it is, I really don't like it. And then the next day we threw a little bit of a curveball, because Miles found out that Ueno Zoo, next to where I was staying, is soon going to be one of the only places you can see pandas outside of China, because China had taken back all of their pandas from all the zoos around the world apparently. So I think you'll agree this was an opportunity too good to pass up, and I'm happy we didn't pass it up because look at this thing, it's so funny. Why does it walk like that? We literally got to see it pooing over the side of its enclosure, like how lucky is that? What a time to be alive, honestly. Great preparation for the new Kung Fu Panda movie coming out. And that was it for Tokyo this time. I was going to be setting out on the second half of my trip, this time southward bound, with my first stop, a place that I've always wanted to see, that being Mount Fuji. Big mountain. Here I am in Kawaguchi standing in front of Mount Fuji everyone. <laughs> wow! I can't quite believe it. I've wanted to come here for so long. And now it is right behind me. Arguably I should be facing the other way and just staring at it. I'm here in the Fuji Five Great Lakes area for the next few days so I'm going to be seeing a lot of this dome right here. That is if it stays clear to be fair. Anyway that's nice. I've got to find my hotel now but pretty epic. Pretty cool. I don't know if you can see, but it's got like a weird sort of like cloud hat on. Just here, there's like a weird sort of halo effect. Kind of crazy, guys. I don't know.
time to taste a square orange, everyone. Um, I've been seeing a lot of square fruits around this country. Don't know really what the obsession is. How do they even do it? Like, do they grow it in a box or something? I guess I just wonder if it tastes any different because it is square. Because half of tasting is seeing, do you not? Wait, this isn't an orange. Is this a persimmon? I think I got the wrong thing here. Yeah, this is not an orange. I mean, it's still nice, I'm not complaining. <laughs> So there you have it everyone, that's the end of this episode. As you can see, Mount Fuji is a little bit cloudy today, so I haven't been filming as much, but also I'm just a bit tired. Um, hopefully I'll be able to stitch this together okay in the edit. It's goodbye from me, and it's goodbye from that mountain there. <laughs> okay, bye.